medical limitations took today's Comfort Kills guest out of the career he had pursued for more than 30 years. A liver transplant followed by a kidney transplant made the corporate world think Paul Silva couldn't work. The story of Paul's life and path has two components, medical and spiritual. He is here today to share his story and blessing by having survived multiple near-death experiences. Paul believes the glory goes to God. Not deterred, he found the transition allowed him to focus on what his gifts are to better serve others. Paul's new mission in life is to help us reignite our spiritual growth so that we can use our gifts to impact others around us. Hi, Paul. I'm so excited to have you here with me today. How are you? Oh, I'm great, Jasmine, and I uh, am happy to be here with you, too. <laughs> yes, it's it's been a long time coming. We've been trying mm -hmm. to arrange this for a while, and between the yeah. two of us, there's just it's been busy. It's been a little bit um, hectic for yeah. us, but so glad to have you here today, and, and really just uh, really excited to share your story, because it is one incredible story that, that led you to where you are, and I would love you to just kind of introduce yourself and tell us um, what your story looks like. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Paul Silva, as Jasmine said, and uh, I come out of a long background of working in the financial services area for more than 30 years. Uh, but the end of my career uh, was brought on by medical complications. Mm -hmm. I was able to work through at first, you know, a few things. Uh, but eventually, when it got to the point where I was on dialysis, that mm. just doesn't work well with a regular nine to five kind of existence because it just takes up so much of your day and saps so much of your energy and, and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. But to start a little earlier on in that whole medical thing, and and I address that first because mm -hmm. the, the spiritual component didn't really come into play until partway through the medical experience. Mm. Uh, so... My first challenge uh, was that I had contracted a, a blood virus that attacks the liver and mm. it uh, basically ate the liver <laughs> and made it wow. totally non-functional and so forth. Uh, okay. So I got to the point where I needed a transplant and uh, I do want to put in a good word for the people at the uh, organ and donor transplant uh, charity. I did some work for them for a few years after mm. um, because there are many more people who need this sort of help mm -hmm. than there are people who are donors. Um, so yeah. keep that in mind. If you haven't signed your license, do that. And right. one quick thing on that is don't just sign your license if your state, uh, that's how they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also make sure you tell your next of kin because right. if, if they don't know it, it doesn't make any difference what you've signed because the organ procurement coordinators will defer to your your relatives. Oh, if wow. they say, gee, I don't know about this, they'll just cancel it, and that's mm. the end of the donation. But anyhow, wow. back to the story. <laughs> um, so I needed a liver transplant. The waiting list was like 14 months long, mm. and uh, during that period of time, my medical condition degraded, and uh, there's some interesting stories. We probably won't go into them, but mm -hmm. uh, about what you go through during that. And I'm not just talking about suffering. I'm talking about uh, there's a, a connection between your liver and your brain, uh, mm. which which causes all sorts of stuff to happen when your liver hasn't been functioning for quite a while. Uh, wow. But at, at any rate, at the end of this 14 month period of time, I was blessed with uh, a donor being available and uh, was rushed off to, uh, in this case, Mass General Hospital uh, for this transplant. And uh, it went reasonably well. Uh, it did take basically two operations and a ton of money. There's, so mm -hmm. there's a, a financial component <laughs> in, in this as well. You got yeah, medical, yeah. financial, and spiritual. Uh, yeah. But at any rate, uh, I, I came through that, and it was a real learning experience. Um, Again, not just about the suffering, but about the, the closeness of God. When mm -hmm. you really need him, he is there for you. Mm. Uh, I had come to the Lord only a year or two before it, 
but my mm -hmm. faith had already been built up to the strength level that uh, the surgeons were amazed when when they came out and told my wife after that operation that uh, there's textbook this guy was dead there was, there was no way in the world oh. we were going to bring him out of it and right. so that they acknowledged that faith played a big part uh, wow. in my survival right and that's if you put yourself in the shoes of the surgeons that's pretty difficult because you know they're very empirically minded technical mm -hmm. you know good at what they do and everything so it's hard for them to not want to take credit and Right. Even harder, probably, for them to give the glory to God. Uh, but at any rate, uh, mm -hmm. so I came through that. Uh, and then things went along okay for a while with just some minor medical stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's when the, the financial part of the being broken. I mean, in, in Christian literature, we, we refer to reaching that point where you become broken enough to be willing to accept the Lord. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was previously a very self-sufficient, if it's going to get done, I'm going to do it kind of guy, yeah. thinking that I could not rely on anybody but myself, mm -hmm. which is actually not a good place to be. <laughs> you know, right. It, yeah, it, it is better to, to know that you can trust the Lord. Um, but so things went along all right, except for financially. I mean, that was a, a nine and a half hour operation mm. who, whose bill came mm -hmm. to well over 300,000 just for the operation. Right. And then you talk, you know, you're wow. in ICU for a month and ICU is not cheap. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, so uh, what the Lord did in that was he broke me of my self dependence, mm -hmm. thinking that I could always provide for myself so that I would learn to look to him as mm -hmm. my provider. Okay. And believe me, ever since then, I've had a whole lot more peace trusting in him because yeah. he's a lot better a provider than I am. <laughs> you know? I hear you. So, yeah. So anyhow, that, that was the first stage of the whole medical thing. And when you have a transplant, you're required to stay on what they call immunosuppressants, mm -hmm. which are pretty toxic drugs. And uh, they keep your body from rejecting the new mm -hmm. organ. Right. Uh, which is all fine and good. And that, and that went pretty well. But over a period of time, the toxicity of these drugs has other effects. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, uh, I would not have been diabetic were it not for these drugs. And right. I'm not complaining about the drugs. They did their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I right. still have that liver, so I can't complain. Uh, but, but it did take its toll. Uh, it eventually knocked out my kidneys and that's why I mentioned dialysis earlier is that uh, when your kidneys fail uh, mm -hmm. and you need to be, it's, it's sort of like semi life support. You only, you just go in for four hours a day instead of all day. <laughs> right. So yeah. uh, at any rate, um, yeah. after two and a half years, process, which anybody who's been through it or seen a relative go through it again, mm -hmm. it's okay to donate a kidney, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, but they know that it, it saps your strength after mm -hmm. a while. It, it takes its toll. Uh, and I was getting pretty tired. And right. all of a sudden, a friend of mine from church comes up to me one Sunday and says, you know what? I was thinking about it. I got two kidneys. You only need one of them. So why don't we go ahead and do this thing? Wow. And so he, you know, volunteered to be a live donor. Mm. Uh which to me was a, a hugely Christ-like thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, the wow. word says that, you know, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your brother, right? Right. Well, this guy had never even been through even a minor operation before, and he was willing to subject himself to what is a major operation. Oh, my. In fact, it's harder on the donor than it is on the recipient. Mm. And I'd already been through a much larger um, organ transplant than mm -hmm. a kidney. So this mm -hmm. was like a walk in the park to me <laughs> compared to him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? you know? So uh, at any rate, some of the other medical complications that were involved, and I don't mean to bore your listeners with, with details, oh, but, no. I, but I think it's important to get the picture of the yes. how much was involved with it. Right. And that's only because God had to go so far out of his way uh -huh. to get through my thick skull. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, right? So um, going back to the liver transplant, when, when they opened me up to mm -hmm. do the transplant, uh, they found that the organ had been shut down long enough to become mm -hmm. cancerous. And cancer is pretty common in long-term liver failure patients. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but they have a protocol for everything in these these transplant units where up to a certain point it's okay beyond a certain point they just show mm. you back up and say have a nice day because you yeah. know we're right. not going to waste a perfectly good organ on a guy who's already got cancer that's too far yeah. developed right wow. so uh, i was just under that i think yeah. the two two centimeters comes to mind i had three spots of just under two so they went ahead mm -hmm. and did it and and i survived wow. it oh and to put it in time perspective mm -hmm. this was 25 years ago mm -hmm. when a liver oh. transplant was a much more experimental situation right. than it yeah. is today now yeah. they're banging them out almost as readily as they do kidneys mm -hmm. but it is more complicated um as a matter of fact there, there was three of us on the wing and i was the only survivor to give you an idea of how early on in the liver transplant uh, wow. process that was. So a bunch of years go by, the drugs take their effect, the kidneys uh -huh. get knocked out, and then this guy steps forward, and I've got a live donor. And by the way, the experience from the recipient's point of view uh -huh. is much, much better with a live donor. Okay. I immediately stopped needing um, the dialysis. Wow. Which, you know isn't always the case if if you right. have a cadaverous uh, donor mm -hmm. you may have to stay on dialysis for quite a while but at any rate mm -hmm. boom all better right so right uh, in in the meantime oh yeah one thing about dialysis just to bring up another medical component uh mm -hmm. the first day they put me on dialysis uh half an hour into getting on the machine i had a heart attack <laughs> you know, wow. and, and that was that that was my first heart attack. I had another one subsequent to that. So uh, I've had oh my. two. It seems like everything came in twos because uh -huh. I guess God knows he can't get my attention with just one example. <laughs> <laughs> so he the transplants were in twos. The heart uh -huh. attacks were in twos. The stents to fix the heart attacks were in twos. Oh, you know, all, all this stuff was in twos, oh my. Uh, including the cancer. Because mm -hmm. uh, after the transplant, several years later, um, there was evidence that the cancer had returned, mm -hmm. and and that's and that's not really that unusual uh, in liver cancer patients. Mm -hmm. you know, the recidivism, if you want to call it that, or it coming back, uh, mm -hmm. does happen. Okay, and uh, would you like me to take a couple of minutes and tell you a miraculous story about that? Absolutely, yes, please. Oh, okay. well, yes, <laughs> see. What I learned through this process is that the first time mm -hmm. God pulled me out of the pit, so to speak, he used man, the information that he revealed to man to be able to do liver transplants mm -hmm. was what was used. So he didn't have to do any miracles. That's mm -hmm. what I call a divine intervention, mm -hmm. right? Where he's on your side. Uh, but he doesn't have to change any of the physical laws that he created in order to do it. Okay. All right. He just okay. has man do it. And we have a responsibility as people here on his planet, yep. <laughs> right. To mm -hmm. do for each other. Yeah. Because he uses us mm -hmm. right, for divine intervention to take place. Now let's go back to uh, this cancer coming back. Mm -hmm. I, I get one of those scans that uh, said you have a mass on your liver. And knowing my history and knowing that it does come back, I says, mm -hmm. okay, so the cancer's back. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And then uh, I go back out to Mass General. And in the meantime, there's a lot of prayer going on. I have a very supportive church family. You know, there's okay. a lot of people praying for me. Okay. And, and there's okay. a whole nother story. I don't know if we'll have time for that today. Absolutely. About, about how that <laughs> came back. Uh, but, but at any rate, uh, with all this prayer and my faith and so mm -hmm. forth, when I get back out to Boston for uh, another scan, mm -hmm. that mass on my liver had just totally disappeared. Now, there was only two weeks between the first scan and the mm -hmm. second scan. All right? Okay. Yeah. And I know, I know people can be kind of reluctant to use the word miracle. Uh -huh. uh, because it's very hard to comprehend right. uh, breaking physical mm -hmm. laws because mm -hmm. we're so used to relying on physical. I mean, gravity is gravity every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and so it's, it's difficult for us to wrap our heads around. God has the power since he created the laws to suspend okay. them in a unique situation where it fulfills his will. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So when I say the word miracle on the second one, right. it's because even though there have been cases of what they call spontaneous remission in mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. all right, it doesn't usually happen within two weeks. Mm -hmm. All right. It's yeah. usually you, you treat them for a year or two and then, oh, great, we're in remission. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so at any rate, hmm. God did that to show me the difference between a divine intervention and an outright miracle. Mm -hmm. right? okay. uh, and there, there have been other things too, but, you know, right. <laughs> I don't want to go on and on. Wow. Uh, yeah. Because I already have. <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. It's, yeah. And it's perfect because you're telling your story and you're telling yeah. it the way that you want. Paul's story to be told. So it's it's mm -hmm. very important that the the listeners are able to hear that from your perspective and your experience. Um, but one of the things I did want to touch on, Paul, since you mentioned the organ donation and that you were you helped volunteer with their organization for a couple of years afterwards, it's just um, let's let's bring that to light a little bit because I don't think that topic gets discussed enough. Me as a nurse, like we have to go through if if we work at a um, hospital or a setting where organ donation may occur. That's one of the things that we learn about, right? And so mm -hmm. I don't believe that everybody understands it well enough. And there's this whole uh, misconception that if you are an organ donor, and I even had this discussion with my teenage daughter recently, is that if you're an organ donor, the rumor is, is that they'll rush that person to preserve organs as opposed to actually saving their lives, you know? And and I, I just want to kind of debunk all of this. And from your perspective on what you helped with the organization, just mm -hmm. kind of speak a little bit more about it, just to kind Kind of enlighten people what the the what volunteering to be an organ donor truly means and and what it may look like um on the on the back end of things i guess once you become an organ donor and then like you had mentioned making sure your next of kin knows as well mm -hmm. yeah. can you go into a little bit more sure. details for that? yeah um what i did for them for like i said it was two three years where uh I live near a medical center, uh, nowhere near the size of Mass General, but enough mm -hmm. so that uh, there are students there that um, would want a lecture on this sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I mostly did just speaking for them. Uh, but what I learned is internally, the way the organization works, it is designed with what they call protocols or mm -hmm. processes, methods, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. that are so patient sensitive it's mm -hmm. incredible right? mm -hmm. so any of the urban myths about mm -hmm. you know they're not going to give you the same treatment because you're an organ donor and and they want right. that organ no primarily mm -hmm. they want to save your life mm -hmm. okay they don't even think about it doesn't even come up they don't even know whether you're a donor or not mm -hmm. until after there's nothing more that they can do Right. So you you really do not have to worry about that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I kind of object to some of the nonsense that goes on in in mm -hmm. Hollywood with TVs and movies that 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 totally misrepresents the mm -hmm. uh, organ donor experience. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. uh, it it is actually very compassionate. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're very careful. They do things right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, so there's no need to worry. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of the other questions that sometimes come up uh, in regards to that, uh, there are no organized religions that forbid it. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you're worried about, gee, I don't know what God thinks of this. Well, if you think of God the way I think of God, he's all about mm -hmm. love and, and doing a loving thing is not going to offend him. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, now I was trying to think of what was the other thing besides, oh, and cost. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to be an organ donor, just go ahead and do it. It's not going to set your family back a dime. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the cost is absorbed by the recipient's health insurance, not yours. Mm -hmm. So you don't, so you don't have to worry about finances mm -hmm. or any other considerations. Uh, I apologize if my dog barks a little bit because, mm -hmm. He's a great He's dog, but he does not like delivery people. Oh, <laughs> so, I so. thought he was just passionate about organ donation and want yeah, to get his yeah, two cents yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get him all worked up about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. at any rate, there's really nothing wrong with the process other yeah. than the fact that the donor recipient list is so much larger than the donors mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. And that's why the long waiting period. 
Right, and, right. And I don't remember the numbers anymore, uh, but thousands and thousands of people die while they're still on the waiting list. Right. Just because there are not donors yeah. available. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. that's something that we can make an impact on by not just yourself, mm -hmm. but if you become a donor, encourage others to become a donor too. Because the, exactly. the only way the word's going to spread uh, effectively is from person to person. Mm hmm. And, and 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 really desensitizing some of the urban legends that are coming from that by by making it um, uh, not such a taboo topic to speak about. Right. I think you know from a, from a nursing perspective, and I was a NICU nurse, so that's neonates, um, yeah. newborn babies. You know, some of them born way too mature, premature. But the the issue is a lot of parents go into having. Um, go into a pregnancy not thinking that anything could ever go wrong. And so what we end up facing is when children come out with anomalies and things that we just try, 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 and we can't fix, there comes a point where we cross that bridge of what do we do next? Is there anything left to do medically for this patient? Or are we just keeping this patient comfortable and sustaining life through a ventilation? You know, and, and we're helping this patient breathe and, and maintain life, but it's not a life to, it's not, um, they won't be able to come out of this on the other side, healthy and running and abundant with full of life, you know? And, and those are very difficult topics that the parents have with the providers. And what is difficult is that the next thing is, okay, would you like your child to now be an organ donor? And no parent wants to hear their two month old baby be an right. organ donor. So it's a very difficult decision. So we as nurses at the bedside in the NICU see this a lot happen when we have um, situations where the patient's life is no longer sustainable. Very, very difficult situation. So I imagine on the adult side, on all the other side of things, because I work in a pediatric hospital, we have it happen as well. Sometimes um, families just don't expect a trauma to happen. Nobody anticipates a trauma or a terrible car accident or anything to happen. But when it does and their child's um, brain is no longer active, there are certain measures we have to take and certain, certain discussions we have to have. And it's a very difficult one. So I imagine on the adult side of things, being transparent about wanting to do or thinking about doing organ donation, being an organ donor is very important because then you're no longer leaving your family with that burden when you're no longer yeah. able to speak for yourself. And so yeah. I think when you're when you're there at the hospital and the providers and the medical team are already saying we've done everything we can do. That's that's the part where you already want those decisions to have already been made for you as a family, instead of having mm -hmm. to make now another difficult decision. First, you have to make the decision, okay, is withdrawal of care the right thing to do? And then on top of that, you have to make the decision of organ donation for your your um, your dying family member. And so those are all decisions that you want to just take that burden off. It's like planning your your funeral. If you know that, that um, things may not be as planned and that complications may occur, it's like just making those preemptive plans plans so that your family no longer has to carry that burden. And I think that's incredibly important too. So having those discussions well in advance, letting your next of kid know and just and letting them know what your wishes are so that there's no argument. You know, mom's not saying one thing, dad's not saying another, or sister's yeah. not saying one thing and brother's not saying another. And now there's this this whole argument going on in the family when everybody really should be more focused on just being there for you during your final moments. Yeah. So you brought up a couple of things that uh, because it is very much like a will. Mm -hmm. I used to do estate planning was mm -hmm. what I retired out of. And okay. I always told clients that creating a will isn't just for you to feel like your wishes are being respected. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're doing a favor for your family. Yeah. In, in estate planning cases, you see families torn apart all the time. Mm -hmm. over something that is money, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's not life. All right. But in the um, organ donation environment, mm -hmm. right, it's life, not money. And life to me is more important than money. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you can relieve your family, as you said it very well, relieve them by making the decision ahead of time, mm -hmm. you're doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. And, and, and while you're talking, it occurred to me that, uh, when a person decides to become a donor, they're doing something that does more than they originally thought. I think mm -hmm. the average person thinks organ donation. Okay, so that's like my heart, right? You know, 
but obviously in my case, it's also like your kidneys and, and your liver. Yep. And then uh, on yeah. average, one of the things I learned to answer your question uh, about the um, Center for Donation and Transplant was an organ donor can benefit about 17 lives because mm. it's not just major organs. Mm -hmm. It's things like skin tissue for burn victims. Yeah. Corneas. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I had mentioned when I was out in Boston that uh, only one of the three of us that were on the wing survived. One of those that did not uh, spent a lot of time with my wife while we were both there at the same time and so forth. Mm -hmm. And she came back from that and became a cornea uh, harvester, if you will. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay, organ uh, coordinator. Okay. Because okay, she was okay. so touched by it. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of tissue. Let, let me just tell you a real short story about the tissue part, right? Because right. I never right. knew about that. I mean, the organs is organs, but tissues it doesn't even cross your mind. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, after uh, I had the first transplant, I used to stay at a place near the hospital and take a shuttle back and forth. It was run by the hospital, right? And mm -hmm. on that shuttle bus, there were a number of patients for the Shriners Burn um, Institute, which mm -hmm. is on the way to Mass General, right? Yeah, yeah. So I would see these kids who had survived house fires mm -hmm. and were going through a series of, not just one bear operation, but a series of a long time of repetitive operations and the tissue donations that they grafted mm -hmm. to relieve these kids paint could burn. You, you know, as a nurse, probably if you've seen mm -hmm. burn cases, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pain involved in that. Yes. Okay? Yes. You know, so it's a huge thing. If you can alleviate the amount of pain that mm -hmm. you can save somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I just say that to kind of promote the organ donation because 17 people is a lot to impact. Mm -hmm. you know? It is. Yeah. So. Yeah. 17 people, 17 families, yeah, 17 families. survivors. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I definitely, um, a huge, huge supporter of that. And, and I think once I became an adult and the, the urban legends were debunked and I understood better what it truly meant. And then I don't know if you've ever seen the movie that Will Smith was starred in with, uh, I think it's called seven pounds. I want to say, yes. Yep, and that, that, that. Ins that inspired me as well. I don't know what you think about it from a recipient perspective on, um, some of the, the reality of, of what the movie was, um, and the script was, but I, I definitely was very inspired by that. I felt like it was a great, um, kind of, a backstory of what happens on the other side with the recipients at the end. Paul, I think I lost yeah. you for a second there. Okay. Yeah, we did, but we're back. <laughs> okay. So I was just saying that the, I think that the movie was a really great, um, you know, I don't know what you think. So definitely please chime in. But I felt like it was a really great uh, look into what it looks like on the recipient side too, at the end of the movie. So it really yeah. inspired me to think differently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a good movie. I mean, Will Smith is a great actor anyhow. So yeah, <laughs> I like pretty much whatever he does. But yeah, that that did shed some light on a topic that there's a lot of mystery around. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that I agree with 100% of what was in there. But but for mm -hmm. the most part, I was, I was pretty pleased with what it mm -hmm. presented. Okay, awesome. And so I, um, one of the places that I've, I've trained in before was a kidney and transplant unit. Um, so we had lots of patients at the time with end stage renal disease, and then those who were pending transplant going into having a transplant. And, and so I just wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit by saying, like, from my experience at the bedside training in those areas is that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that just a uh, you know, organ donations and, and organ transplants aren't just you go in, you do it, it's successful, you move on. There's a lot of, like you said, immunosuppressant um, medications that you have to take mm -hmm. in order to make sure that your body is not rejecting the new organ that it just received as well. And so there's a lot, a lot that goes into it um, after the transplant has been done. It's not just a one and done and then, you know, you move on and live a happy, healthy life. It, there's a lot, a lot that comes with it um, along the way. And being, you know, you saying that this was 20 plus years ago when you had your liver transplant and that it was one of three who survived, that that's, those are starking numbers. That's only 33% survival rate, you know, and, mm -hmm. and um, it, it just, 
baffles me that that um, those are the the statistics, and that even today that it's not an easy road for somebody to to go through this. And and so, you know, it comes with lots of complications. And that's kind of what um, you ended up having to, to yeah. um, go through. And, and, but that's also what took you away from your corporate job into mm-hmm. a, you know, where are you at now? What are you doing these days? Mm-hmm. I know we spoke a lot about spirituality. And, and please tell me how you've incorporated that into your world. I, I love to answer that question. Yes. But I have to sure. go back and okay. clarify one little thing. Okay? okay. Because I mentioned an anecdotal example of mm-hmm. one out of three, mm-hmm. I don't want you to have anybody right. else thinking that the survival rate is that low. Yeah. I mean, yes. now they've perfected a lot more things. But even back then, mm-hmm. that was just one incidence from, one time from my in. experience from one yeah. time I was there. I don't think the survival rate was that low across the board, even back then. Okay. Okay. So, you know, just just to clarify that. (laughs) Okay. Now, having gone through all this, um, Mm -hmm. along the way with the medical challenges, uh, God was very close to me. Mm -hmm. He he taught me uh, ways to deal with pain, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, Suffering is a, a central tenet of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. All right. In that as Christ suffered, when we suffer, all right, it's not for no reason. All right. It is mm-hmm. to make us into better Christians so that we can help other people better than we could had we never suffered. Mm-hmm. Right? I would go so far as to say I wouldn't take back any of it. You know, if I had yeah. the option of rolling back time and saying, hey, well, let me just skip that part of my life. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't be as close to Jesus as I am had he not had the opportunity to be with me and to help me through that. Mm-hmm. So I want to make sure, as, as your little intro said, that, that the glory goes to God. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't do anything. The, the resiliency that I experienced Mm -hmm. was given to me. It wasn't something that I could Mm -hmm. self-manufacture. In fact, uh, I have a a pastor I've been with for almost 25 years now Mm -hmm. who sometimes jokes that uh, I've wasted so many eulogies on Paul (laughs) that I've I've seen him (laughs) on death's door, go home, write a eulogy, and then next Sunday he's at church, you know? (laughs) Yeah, but uh, at any rate, what, whatever I've been through has been for me to learn how to help other people come into a closer relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. So what I do full time now mm-hmm. is discipleship, right? Teaching people how to have a better relationship mm-hmm. and, and it improves their lives immensely. Okay. And, and I do that through a specific course uh, mm-hmm. That's called Three Steps to Wholeness. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that, that God did, can I go back and tell you a story about the, just because it just occurred to me, about yeah, the, the pain, ma- pain management thing? Sure, okay. absolutely. This may be painful for your listeners. Okay. <laughs> okay. O- only because I might have to sing to do it. Okay, right? no worries. And I don't, I don't <laughs> say well, <laughs> you know, what I mean? but anyhow. While I was going through the liver transplant process, Mm -hmm. um, you have an effect in your brain, which you probably know being a nurse and so forth, called hepatoencephalopathy. Mm -hmm. And and the way I know I don't have it anymore is because I can say that word. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When I had it, I couldn't say any long words. I couldn't say much about anything. Because what happens is the analogy is, your, your liver is like an oil filter. It takes out the toxicity from your blood mm-hmm, at the okay. same time manufacturing blood. So it's a, a really hugely complex chemical organ. Right? Mm-hmm. But when it shuts down, the blood still has those toxic particles in it, and it doesn't know where to dump them. So the next finest filter you have is your brain. Mm. So you end up with a buildup of all this toxicity in your brain, mm-hmm. and as time goes by... It builds up so much that you get stupider and stupider. I know that okay. some people are offended by the word stupid, but it was me, so I can say it. I'm not saying it about somebody else, right? Gotcha. I got so stupid that 
buttoning my shirt was a mental exercise, oh. right? Where you, you button one button uh -huh. and I'd have to actually stop and think, okay, now what do I do next? Oh, and wow. a minute or two later, I'd figure out it's the next button, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so, so you, you get to this point. All right. Well, while I'm on that treadmill, if you will, of getting less and less mentally capable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God stepped in and gave me something that I could use to control pain. Mm. And it had to do with relying on him. Mm -hmm. now, here's where it may get painful. He knew I had very limited mental capacity at the time. So he spoke to me in a way that, that I could understand even there, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. which was to bring to my remembrance a tune now, I didn't even remember having known this tune, but it was, you know, from, I love blues music, right? So okay, I, yeah. it was from way back there, right? And uh -huh. there was there was this song that said, rolling in my sweet baby's arms, rolling yeah. in my sweet baby's arms. We're going to lay around the shack till the mail train comes back, rolling mm -hmm. in my sweet baby's arms. So that was the tune. Mm -hmm. right? I could remember the tune, right? Mm -hmm. And all he gave me, instead of all those words, was just, leaning on the everlasting arm because mm. that was about as long and that would just repeat through my head and while i was having a, a pain experience mm -hmm. okay i could just cycle that leaning on the everlasting arm mm -hmm. and and it would put me in a peaceful place mm -hmm. where the pain didn't really have access to me okay right? i mean pain is a physical thing but yeah. how you respond to it is a mental thing Right, yeah. And that's one example of, of many of mm -hmm. the tools that he gave me that, that he taught me because he wanted me to know that he was right there with me. Wow. That's the thing that I always try to impress people with. He's right there. Mm -hmm. If you can't feel him, it's not because mm -hmm. he's not there. It's because you need to learn how. Mm -hmm. to communicate with them. And that's what mm -hmm. the whole discipleship course is back. So we'll get, we'll get back on track with, with that. Okay. 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 So Paul, tell me, you know, what is the, the ideal type of client? Because I imagine when people come to you, they're in great distress with the, whatever's going on in their lives. And I think a lot of times when people find themselves in that situation, the very first thing they want to do is find a blame, find a culprit and not want to trust in, in anything higher than themselves, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're looking for tangible things that they can, that around them that they want to trust and believe in. And then all these theories of, of religion and God and everything else becomes, well, if there really is a God, why is this happening to me? So can you explain to me what the typical, typical and ideal type of clients are for you? And then, and then what, how do you ever cross paths with those individuals who are, I guess, at, at some point becoming agnostic in their lives and just saying, none of this is real. If this was real, then this wouldn't be happening to me or my family member. Mm hmm Okay. Well, what my experience is, is different than the picture you just painted in, mm -hmm. in this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the luxury of, because I'm retired and I, and I don't have to do this, I'm doing this because I want to do it. I'm called to do it. And so mm -hmm. forth. I have the luxury of choosing who to serve. Mm -hmm. I am called to serve a group of people that is mm -hmm. not the same group of people that you would assume. Mm -hmm. I don't focus on, on helping people who are in catastrophic medical conditions. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. I've been drawn because of what I've been equipped with mm -hmm. to help them. Okay. To folks who already believe. And I'm, I'm not so much of an effective evangelist mm -hmm. of overcoming the people who are in that agnostic condition. Right. right. Okay. Even though I myself was an atheist for 25 years and wow. I can relate to, you know, before I came to the Lord, oh, I, I was an enemy. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I would steal your faith by misapplication of logic if I had a chance. Oh, you wow. Um, so my conversion, if you will, was sort of like Paul being knocked off his high horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, back to the, yeah. the, the people that I serve mm -hmm. are people who already believe but are not living up to the potential that God built into them. Okay. Right. I've been shown that 
as your creator, mm -hmm. you were created with built in, excuse the stealing from medical technology, built in DNA based mm -hmm. talents mm -hmm. from the time you're born, in my opinion, from before when you were born, mm -hmm. you have things that you're going to be better at and things you're not going to be so good at. Right. Right. Yeah. And they're called motivational gifts or talents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's three steps to wholeness course that I teach. That's a major component of it is identifying what your gifts are. Okay. Because once you know what is created into you to make you a unique person, mm -hmm. and there's another layer of complexity to it. This is not real complex, but you have a primary talent and a secondary talent. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between those two is what makes your path to purpose clear mm -hmm. okay i could give you mm -hmm. an example but let's just settle for that because there's only one out of three steps <laughs> okay okay yeah what, once you identify what your gifts are and now you know what your purpose is mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. then you're in a position to be used by god to do what it was he originally created you to do in the first place mm -hmm. and you know what it is so much easier than living life trying to be something you're not or trying to get better yeah. at skill sets that you weren't equipped to ever get good at. Right. Yeah. And so much people in business, especially, they're trying to fix what they're weak at instead of focusing on their strengths. Mm -hmm. Now, recently mm -hmm. in corporate business literature, they've made kind of a tide turn towards, okay, well, let's focus on, on what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And that's an improvement over the way it used to be. Uh, but if you focus on what you're good at because mm -hmm. they're designed into you, it makes your purpose clear. Mm -hmm. And working towards a purpose takes so much less effort mm -hmm. than just going out there and trying to make money. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, so the, the group of people that I serve is primarily businessmen. Uh, you know, my podcast is called Reigniting the Christian Businessman. Right? Okay. Yeah. And I have to kind of defend from the perspective of by focusing on who you're meant to serve, mm -hmm. you're not excluding everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, if anybody came to me and they wanted to identify their purpose, I'd be perfectly happy to help. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when it comes to creating a course mm -hmm. that is organized and systematic, because business people want results. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yep. if you can show them a path that takes less time and produces more results, they're going to be happier with that. Then mm -hmm. a lot of what's wrong with Christian culture is a lot of it is pretty touchy, feely, vague, all over the place instead of, all right, let's get something done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So the people that I serve are primarily um, Christians who are frustrated with the fact that they believe, but they're not having the fulfillment that mm -hmm. is there for them. It's what we call living below your privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, God okay. wants to be in close relationship with you. Yeah. And if you haven't learned how to communicate with him, how to hear his voice and how to how to live in a way that delights him, mm -hmm. right, you're just not going to have the experience that you could have. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's the clarification on, on who I serve and and how okay. I serve, how, you know, how the course works. I don't know okay. how much time we got left, but, you know, that <laughs> three steps is about as much as I could boil it down to. And. And okay. I shouldn't take credit for it. I mean, by the way, uh -huh. this came to me through God using other people. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, the course is based on three separate components mm -hmm. that I didn't write those books. Okay. Okay. I learned from them and I yeah. learned how to synthesize the use right. of the three books. Mm -hmm. right? And I, I save my uh, clients a ton of time where they don't have to read all the books, although I encourage them to, right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to get the benefits that those books, when they're combined properly, uh, yeah. can lead them through. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what I'm hearing is you're, you're basically the cliff notes of all of these books. You have the knowledge, you have the tools, but you've also synthesized everything together to create what's, what's tried and true for your clients. And I think that's yeah. pretty amazing. You know, I think, yeah. I think a lot of times people, you're right. Businessmen, women are so 
busy in their world that when they're reaching out for help, they're wanting results and they want fast results. And so being able to find somebody of your caliber to help them enhance what it is that they already have innately is is really important as well. And I think that that's what I keep hearing over and over is being able to use your spirituality to enhance what you already have, as opposed to trying to go out there and reach for something that's not true and authentic to what you're capable of doing. And so just and being in tune with yourself is so spiritually awakening in itself. And then mm -hmm. inviting God into that world as well makes it just 10 times more, if not more than that, powerful. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, I thank you for the kind words, but also the the succinctness with which you were able to say it, and you did capture what I'm about. So that that's very Amazing. insightful of you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. No, yeah. that, you know, I just I hear it, and I'm like, oh, this is what we're look, we're looking at. Okay, so I think yeah. that's pretty amazing. So, Paul, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Is there something that you would love to touch on? Any topics that you would like to discuss that I haven't already um, kind of led you into discussing? Uh, the well, one thing that comes to mind, uh, mm -hmm. is because my course is called three steps, mm -hmm. you really should only have three steps, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there, but there is a step before that. Okay? okay. Uh, I find it very commonly experienced among my, the people that I'm meant to serve, um, that not only are they frustrated with their lack of spiritual growth, okay, they're mm -hmm. concerned about the fact that they don't have a good communication, right? right yeah. they, they, they haven't uh, learned yet. And I have to say this, it's the fault of the church mm -hmm. that discipleship doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's mm -hmm. a basic misconception. I'm big on discipleship. I, you know, I, I run that part of my church and mm -hmm. discipleship. The easiest way to describe it is the Bible doesn't say go out and make converts. The modern okay. church says go out and make converts. Right. Because in our empirical age, it seems like the biggest hurdle is getting people to accept on a mental level. Mm -hmm. the existence of God, because there's so many people saying otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. But what the real command was, the message was, go out and make disciples. And disciples are different than converts. Converts mm -hmm. say, yes, I believe in God. Mm -hmm. And maybe they even go to church. Mm -hmm. And maybe they even feel like they've been saved by that experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm not saying they haven't been. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once they have their fire insurance in place, they're done. Right. With growth. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's not God's plan. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. God wants us to be disciples, which goes beyond mere mental assent to his existence. Mm -hmm. But understanding that the relationship is it's pretty simple. It's he's God and I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. if you want to be in the right relationship, you you know, like we mentioned my dog earlier, right? We have a relationship where he understands that I'm the source of his food, just like God is my provider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm the boss and he's the dog. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get those two things confused, we have a wonderful relationship. Well, the yeah. same thing is true between man and God. Yeah. Right? So okay. I'm really into discipleship. Uh, helping people grow into where they realize that God wants to use them. He mm -hmm. equipped them. He gave them these motivational gifts, these talents. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. He gave them a purpose and he's perfectly willing to help you along the way mm -hmm. to do his will. Okay. So. All right. That's a big thing. Wow. And so I distracted Paul myself. I'm sorry for, for you. <laughs> I just realized I, I went around in a loop there and I didn't, Oh my goodness, the, no worries. The, the, <laughs> the, the first thing <laughs> was in order to effectively pursue these three steps, mm -hmm. there is a prerequisite. Okay. okay. I mentioned earlier that I get to pick and choose who I work with. Mm -hmm. All right. And people who recognize that they first need to develop a communication channel with God. Mm -hmm. right? And that's called prayer, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not how fancy you can talk or how long you can do it. It's about establishing an intimate communication where you're talking to him like a friend because mm -hmm. he does want to be in a relationship with you. He does want to be a friend of yours. It says okay. so. 
Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's a little prayer component first. You get that straight and then you can go through the three steps. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to correct that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Paul, if I gave you a billboard, um, what would you put on that billboard? Funny you should ask that because my answer is different than what you might be expecting. Okay. okay. I had uh, this image come to me once when see my entrance into Christianity was pretty mental. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a way that some people get there. Mm -hmm. All right. You have to grow past that, but it's nothing wrong with getting there any way you get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I had this image that the problem with people and theology is they look at one page of the Bible at a time because, mm -hmm. you know, it's all I can see, right? Mm -hmm. So this billboard image that I had was simply a billboard that has the first page, Genesis 1, up in the upper left-hand corner, mm -hmm. and then all the pages just laid out side by side next to each other. Okay. Right? So that the whole Bible was represented all on one screen or one billboard, yeah. so to speak. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and, and the caption below would just see the way God sees it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. He sees it all, all at once. Mm -hmm. We're limited. Mm -hmm. It's hard for us to do that. Okay. Right. But yeah. Wow. That, so that billboard has absolutely nothing to do with what I do, mm -hmm. <laughs> my calling or anything else. It was just an image that I yeah. got. That, yeah. You know, no, I've heard all kinds of crazy answers yeah. for billboard questions. So yeah. <laughs> but that's a, I love that's it. I love, a good question. <laughs> I love the the visual imagery of that. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Now, if people wanted to reach out to you, Paul, to to just talk a little bit more, learn about what it is that you can do for them, or just really connect because they find that you're a cool guy and they just wanted to get to know you, or <laughs> any other questions that they may have, how can they reach yeah. out to you? Well, really, the best way is email for me. Okay. I mean, I have a website. I have it. All of this stuff is electronically coordinated and so forth. But mm -hmm. you just can't beat starting a relationship on an individual level instead yeah. of just, I mean, I could send you a video, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't interact that way. And I think communication is so important that I'd rather people email me and the address yeah. is just Paul at three steps to wholeness. I think it's mm -hmm. going on your screen now. Yes. And the only trick to that where you can make a mistake is the three is a number, not, mm -hmm. not spelled out like a word. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's no spaces in it. So if you just write to me at Paul at three steps to wholeness.com, I assure you, I will get back to you. All you right. know, drives me nuts when people, you know, don't respond to email. Okay. And I will get back to you. And then <laughs> as, as the relationship develops, if, if we need to have a phone call to be mm -hmm. able to communicate better, then I'm perfectly open to that too. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for coming out today, sharing your story and just telling us about your journey and, and finding spirituality and God and embracing that into your world, especially, you know, with the knowledge bomb at the end towards there that, that you said that you were once an atheist. And so that just like, I think if we started with that, I would have came into this with a different, <laughs> like, you know, it would have been a little different going into it, but wow, mm -hmm. just that's, that's really a huge yeah. wow right there. And, and, you know, and it's, you I think there's there's a lot that you're doing for this community and and for businessmen out there and I I thank you for doing that and helping people find their their you know authentic selves and 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 taking it to the next level by by including God and spirituality into their life. So thank you so much Paul and I really appreciate you coming out today. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me, and I, I just want to compliment you on how good you are at what you do. <laughs> Thank you. you. Know, I've talked to a lot of people, and, and you're just a real pleasure to work with, and, and I want you to know that I'll be praying for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay.